All right, uh, good afternoon again. My name is Heather Ansley and I am PBA's Associate um, Executive Director of Government Relations. We wanna welcome you today to our webinar on improving VA home and community-based services uh, for veterans and caregivers. Before we dive into the presentation uh, today, we wanna just go over a few administrative items. Uh, so today's webinar uh, will be recorded and is available uh, or will be available for viewing on PVA's website. Um, if you're on today's webinar, you will also receive um, a, an email providing you with a link uh, to that recording. We do have clo live closed captioning available for today's event. So you can click the CC button that's in the meeting controls bar at the bottom of your screen uh, to turn that on. We will have time at the end of our presentation uh, to ask uh, questions and receive answers. So we ask that if you have a question that you would put those in the Q&A box, um, you can uh, put them in the box at any time during the presentation, but we will um, answer them live uh, at the end of today's presentation. Um, and please do use the Q&A box instead of the chat box for today's event. Uh, so with that, I will um, like to introduce Morgan Brown, who is PBA's National Legislative Director, and he's going to walk us through the agenda for today's event. Morgan? All right. Well, thank you, Heather, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm joined today by uh, Associate Legislative Director Roscoe Butler, and today we are going to talk a little bit about VA's home and community-based services. Um, and then the primary thrust of this webinar, um, the Elizabeth Dole HCBS for Veterans and Caregivers Act of 2022, um, how you can help us advocate for this legislation, some resources, and then of course, answer your questions. Um, next slide. So first and foremost, uh, what is VA HCBS and why is it important? More than half of veterans using VA right now are over the age of 65. This factor coupled with their unique health needs makes many elderly veterans especially vulnerable going into nursing homes and institutional care. VA's SEID system of care provides a full range of care for all enrolled veterans who have sustained a spinal cord injury, but its availability for long-term care is extremely limited. VA only operates six long-term facilities with about 180 beds available at any given time. PVA continues to advocate for more SEID long-term care centers and increased numbers of beds, but we also recognize there are many opportunities to improve HCBS programs, especially their availability. Studies show, and as many of our members will attest, care in home settings is preferable over care in a clinical facility. Home and community-based services, or HCBS, are types of person-centered care that's delivered in the home or in the local community. Having access to it allows veterans to avoid or delay institutional care. This is particularly important considering the shortages in the number of long-term uh, SEID beds. Also, the many positive aspects of HCBS cannot be overstated. Veterans using these programs have experienced fewer hospitalizations and emergency department visits, reduced hospital, hospital and nursing home days, and fewer nursing home readmissions and inpatient complications. Now I'm gonna ask Mr. Butler to identify VA's current different types of HCBS and then briefly explain what each one does. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. As you may know, VA currently offers a number of home and purchase care programs. We're gonna go through these briefly and I'll identify what these programs are and the services they provide. Uh, many of the programs VA offers today are included in the Elizabeth Doe Bill. The Elizabeth Doe Bill requires that VA make the programs being offered today at all VA healthcare facilities and the services available to veterans who may not currently have access to these services. 
And here's a quick breakdown and description of the programs and services offered today. Home-based primary care, which is a healthcare service provided to veterans in their home. A VA physician supervises the healthcare team who provides the services. Home-based primary care is for veterans who have complex healthcare needs for whom routine clinic-based care is not effective. Home-based primary care is part of the VA standard medical benefit package and all enrolled veterans are eligible if they meet the clinical need for the services and it is available. Medical foster home care are private homes in which a trained caregiver provides services to a few individuals. Some but all, not all residents are veterans. VA inspects and approve all medical foster homes. Veterans residing in medical foster homes are provided a home-like environment while receiving VA home-based primary care. However, under current law, VA does not have, have authority to pay for medical foster home care. But if S-2852 and its companion bill, H.R. 7158, the Long-Term Care Veterans Choice Act, are enacted into law, it would provide the, the authority to pay for a veteran's medical foster home care. Adult Day Health Care is a program veterans can go to during the day for social activities, peer support, companionship, and recreation. All enrolled veterans are eligible for adult day health care if they are eligible for community care and meet the clinical criteria for the service and it, if it is available. Palliative care, which uses comfort care with a focus on relieving suffering and controlling symptoms so that you can carry out daily day-to-day -day activities and continue to do what is most important to you as a veteran. Palliative care aims to improve a veteran's quality of life, mind, body, and spirit. Palliative care can be combined with treatment that is aimed at curing or controlling a veteran's illness. It can be started at the time of their diagnosis and may be provided throughout the course of their illness. Palliative care is part of VHA standard medical benefit package and all veterans are eligible if they meet the clinical need for the services. Remote monitoring. This is a service that allows the veteran physician or nurse to monitor the veteran's medical condition remotely using home monitoring equipment. Veterans can be referred to a care coordinator, coordinator for enrollment in remote monitoring services by any member of their care team. Enrollment is approved by a VA provider for veterans who meet the clinical need for the service. Veterans can be referred to a care coordinator for enrollment in remote monitoring services by any member of their care team. Enrollment is approved by a VA provider for veterans who meet the clinical need for the services. A care coordinator gets health information that each veteran provides through personalized questions answered either on specific equipment by a veteran's computer or their phone. If any of the veteran's health measurements do not seem normal, the care coordinator talks with the veteran's primary care team and then, and then gets back to the veteran with next steps. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the purchase care 
HCBS programs. There are three specific programs, skilled home health care, which is for veterans needing short-term care as they are moving from a nursing, from a hospital or nursing home back to their home. It can also be used to provide continuing care for people with ongoing needs. All enrolled veterans are eligible for skilled home care if they are eligible for community care and they meet the clinical criteria for the services and the services are available. And services can vary by locations. Home or home health care is when a trained care provider comes to a veteran's home and help the veteran take care of themselves and their daily activities. Homemakers and home health aides are who are not nurses, but they are supervised by a registered nurse who will help assess the veteran's daily living needs. All enrolled veterans are eligible for homemaker home health care if they are eligible for community care and meet the clinical care criteria for the service and it's available in their location. Respite care. This is a program that pays for care for a short time when family care need, when the family caregiver needs a break or needs to run an area errand or needs to go out of town for a few days or so. Respite care can be helpful to veterans of all ages and their caregivers. All enrolled veterans are eligible for respite care if they meet the clinical criteria for the service and it is available in their locations. Again, service may vary by locations. If the respite care is provided by a community agency, adult day healthcare center or nursing home, the veteran also needs to meet the community care eligibility criteria. Lastly, veterans directed care. This is a program that provides money directly to the veteran that is managed by the veteran or the veteran's representative. With the help of a counselor, veterans hire their own workers, which may include their own family member or neighbor to meet their daily needs to help them live at home or in the community. All enrolled veterans are eligible for veterans directed care if they are eligible for community care, meet the clinical criteria for the service and the services are available in their location. This is another uh, program where it may not be available at every VA medical center. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Morton. Thank you, Roscoe, for that quick rundown uh, over the, the current programs that are available. Um, now I wanna talk a little bit about the program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers. Um, I know that this is not an HCBS program per se, but there's a direct association between VA caregiver program and the effective delivery of HCBS. This is always a high interest um, subject for our members, and there's been some significant changes involving this program. So um, Roscoe, if you would, could you speak a little bit about the impact of the caregiver program on HCBS, and then talk a little bit about the program's current status? So you may be aware when the program was first implemented on October 1 of 2020, um, VA um, has been challenged based upon their uh, regulations that they implemented and the regulations um, mandated a change in the eligibility rule. And those changes resulted in a significant number of veterans being deemed ineligible or being denied uh, 
to the program to the tune of 87.9% of the veterans who enrolled since October uh, were found not eligible or were denied entry into the program. Uh, this created a serious concern by uh, veteran service organizations like Paralyzed Veterans of America. And we brought those concerns to uh, the VA uh, leadership. And we're happy to say that the leadership recognized and understood our concerns. And as a result, they have decided to halt all suspensions of dismissals from the program, and they are discontinuing the assessment process while, while the program undergoes an evaluation. Uh, we don't have any specific time frame of how long the suspensions of dismissals will last and uh, when they will restart doing assessments, but we will keep you up to date on any changes in that uh, information. Um, with regard to the status of phase two implementation, we, believe, we haven't heard anything contrary to VA's uh, initial plan to roll out phase two beginning October 1 of 2022. However, if we receive any information that's contradictory to the October 1 uh, date, we will reach out to uh, every, all of our members and make them aware of the change. So uh, that's the uh, status at this point, and I'm going to turn it back over to Morgan. Well, thank you, Rosto. And, um, if we can get the next slide. We're going to talk a little bit about the Elizabeth Dole Home and Community Based Services for Veterans and Caregivers Act, uh, which is the principal focus of this webinar. Next slide. So first, just a little bit about what the bill itself is. Um, H.R. 6823 and its Senate version S3854, um, again, the Elizabeth Dole Home and Community-Based Services for Veterans and Caregivers Act of 2022 is a comprehensive uh, legislative package that would expand many of VA's HCBS programs. Um, for, for many months now, uh, we've heard from uh, PVA members expressing concern about the availability of uh, programs like Veterans Directed Care uh, and the importance of continuing to receive payments while, while the veteran is hospitalized uh, and they're a participant of that program. And we were able to take those, uh, that feedback that you provided to us and then um, obviously, so we established a series of legislative priorities for the association earlier in the year, uh, primarily just to improve the availability of long-term services and supports. Uh, we took your concerns and some of our own uh, and sat down with the staff of the House and Senate Veterans Affairs Committees with VA um, and some of our uh, VSO and other community partners. Uh, and together we were able to work on crafting this comprehensive piece of legislation that is going to uh, dramatically improve the availability of these services, uh, not, not only for our members, but all veterans with uh, catastrophic conditions. Um, this bill comes about as the result of many months of discussions about the issues meeting the needs of disabled veterans. Uh, and I'm pleased that PVA was able to play a significant role in its development. Um, and because this bill uh, will have a, what we believe to be a pretty profound impact um, on our members, we thought it would be appropriate to 
take a little bit of time and then kind of walk you through kind of like a section by section explanation of the provisions in this bill and what it would do. So I'm going to ask Roscoe to start that process off uh, focusing primarily on some of the health care um, provisions that are in the bill. So Roscoe, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thanks, Morgan. <clears throat> Currently, under current law, VA is limited to how much it can pay for home community-based services. It's capped at 65% of the cost of nursing home care. And when I testified to Congress uh, several months ago, I shared with them uh, a couple of veterans' experiences uh, where a veteran who lived in one state and moved to another state was authorized uh, a number of hours, I believe it was around 656 hours of expanded care services. And uh, when he transferred from his parent facility to the new facility, they authorized him 24 hours per week. And the reason why they said they couldn't authorize more hours was because he reached that 65% cap. That caused severe hardship for the veteran and his family. And they had to consider placing him into a nursing home. And we had another veteran uh, case where a veteran in North Carolina um, was contacted us uh, and uh, the veteran was re receiving 100 and out, 108 hours per week of care uh, due to the 65% cap. And uh, due to uh, the experience that his caregiver was having and, and burnout uh, and the care of the veteran having reached that cap, the veteran had the veteran family had no choice but to place him in a nursing home. Um, and as we know, veterans uh, prefer being at home than in a or a home-like setting than in a nursing home. So raising the cap would allow veterans who cost of care exceeds the 65% to, con to continue to receive such care in a home community-based setting. Um, now I'll turn it back over to Morgan. No, sorry, next slide. So next slide is on the coordination with programs of all-inclusive care for the elderly. Section three would direct VA to coordinate expanded VA home care programs with other VA programs, such as the program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers and other family federal programs like the Medicare program of all inclusive programs for the elderly, PACE. PACE is a Medicaid, Medicare program that helps people meet their healthcare needs in the community instead of going to a nursing home or other care facilities. Unfortunately, a potential downside of PACE is that it is not in, offered in all locations across the United States. And tapping into these programs and resources uh, to include other federal, state, and local programs would undoubtedly help the VA address veterans' unmet needs. Next slide. So uh, VA's, uh, expanding VA's home base, home community-based services. Um, section four would require the VA to administer the Veterans Directed Care Program, the Homemaker and Home Health Aid Program, the Home-Based 
primary care program and the purchase skill home program at every medical center within two years of the date of enactment of this legislation. Remember back uh, in the discussion about these programs are currently being offered, but they may not be offered across the entire VA spectrum. And we know that a number of members have contacted us about some of these programs not being available in their location. And we are happy to say through our advocacy and so forth, uh, Congress has listened and hopefully upon passage of this legislation, uh, the programs will be made available uh, across the VA system. Uh, for example, the VA, the v Veteran Directed Care Program, which allows veterans to receive home community-based services in a consumer-directed way, and is designed for veterans who need personal care services and help with their activities of daily living. Again, uh, some examples of those services that can be provided includes bathing, dressing, or fixing meals. It is also for veterans who are isolated or whose caregiver is uh, experiencing tremendous burden and veterans uh, to help work through this. The veteran directed care provides veterans a budget for services that is managed by the veterans. And so the veteran doesn't have to uh, uh, get into the adult day health care program. If they choose not to, they can uh, enroll in the veterans directed care and manage their resources and funds. The other change that uh, the Dole bill does, it establishes a homemaker and home health aid program. And I'm not gonna say established because it already is establishes, but it expands the homemaker and home health aid program to be available at every VA medical center and ensures any veteran who lives in any territory or possession of the United States can access the program as well as any uh, Native American veterans. It also expands VA's home-based primary care program, which is overseen by a VA physician. So uh, these are uh, uh, what the Elizabeth Doe Veterans Expansion Bill does. Uh, next slide. So let's talk about the, how the coordination, how these programs coordinate with the Comprehensive Assistance for Family Caregivers program. So let's say the, a veteran is told they're no longer eligible for the caregiver program or uh, you're a new veteran enrolling in the program and you're told that uh, you're deemed ineligible for the program. The Elizabeth Dole bill would require VA to improve the transition of caregivers uh, from the caregiver program to home community-based programs. It also directs VA to provide a personalized and coordinated handoff of veterans and caregivers who are denied or discharged from the program. And it will establish an automatic enrollment in the program of general caregiver support services. And so, um, you know, I talked a little bit about the Comprehensive Assistance for Family Caregivers program, where that program provides veterans uh, a stipend, it pays the veterans a stipend. It also provides for the veterans healthcare needs through the CHAMP VA program 
and it also provides um, training. Under the general caregiver program, the uh, caregiver is eligible for the training, but they would not be eligible for uh, a stipend or hospital care. So uh, that's uh, a requirement on, of how VA has to ensure that there's a smooth and easy transition when a veteran is told they're no longer eligible for the caregiver program into one of the HCBS programs. Uh, I think I'm, that's it. And uh, yes, no, not, no, I'm going to do the improved communications about available for HCBS. I'll, I'll take it from here, Roscoe. Okay, Morgan. Thank you. Uh, can we get the next slide, please? So now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the, uh, I guess you could perhaps say administrative provisions that are in the bill. And the first one is improving communication about availability of HCBS programs. Um, we know from our conversations with many of you uh, have expressed frustration about trying to find information on HCBS. Um, it's available through several websites and other sources, which tends to lead to a lack of awareness about all of the services that might be available. Um, and unfortunately, some of the information that you can see on these websites is incomplete and occasionally uh, it's inaccurate. And when people don't know about the services and programs, they don't participate in them. Section six of this bill seeks to address the problem by establishing a one-stop shop webpage, which would centralize information about all of the available programs for families and veterans and include tools to help them identify the ones that are most appropriate for them. Next slide. So even when veterans have access to HCBS, it can be challenging to find these workers. And too often people assume that because VA is providing caregivers or nurses, they must be well cared for. And unfortunately, that's not always the case. A perfect example of this was the story that PVA National President Charlie Brown shared with Congress during his testimony before the House and Senate Veterans Affairs Committees back in March of this year. On a Saturday morning late last fall, no nurse arrived to help him to get him out of bed. The previous day, the VA contracted home health agency informed him that they hadn't been able to find a nurse to assist him on Saturday morning. He called the scheduler and asked them what he should do and they assured him they would continue to try to find someone to assist him. When nobody showed up the next morning, he called the agency and was notified that nobody would be coming by. To his astonishment, they also informed him that it was his responsibility to find a backup nurse for situations like this. Trapped in his bed, he realized nobody would be coming for him for hours, which meant he wouldn't be able to care for his bladder, drink, or take his medications. Um, he was alone and felt abandoned. Luckily, though, he was able to reach a nurse that was going to care for him that evening, and she agreed to come and help him. Without her help, who knows what could have happened? This was a particularly diff dangerous situation and changes are needed to see that it doesn't happen again to him or anyone else. Throughout the country, acute shortages of home health aides and nursing assistants are threatening care for older veterans and those with serious disabilities. PVA has been a proponent of a vigorous national effort to help curb the effects of these shortages and bolster the direct care workforce. Higher pay for essential caregivers is a necessary component of attracting and retaining a diverse set of people to provide HCBS. However, raising pay alone is not sufficient to solve the crisis we face. Using multiple strategies, such as raising public awareness about the need of, and value of caregiving jobs, providing prospective workers quality training, and developing caregiving as a sound career choice are just a few of the other changes that could help to turn this problem around. We believe the pilot program 
established in section seven of this bill would lessen the difficulty in finding direct care workers at the 10 sites the VA selects. And it may reveal additional ways that VA could alleviate this problem for veterans nationwide. Next slide. And finally, uh, improving consistency. Um, the last section of the bill requires VA's Office of Geriatric and Extended Care to conduct a review of each of it, the programs that it manages to ensure consistency in program management, eliminate service gaps at the medical center level, and ensure the availability of, uh, as well as the access to, um, by veterans, home and community-based services. It also requires VA to assess the staffing needs of the GEC office, and it requires them to establish quantitative goals to assess the specialty care needs of veterans through in-home care, including by ensuring the education of home health aides and caregivers of veterans in the following areas, uh, dementia care, care for spinal cord injuries and diseases, ventilator care, and then other specialty care areas as determined by the secretary. No later than a year after the date of the enactment of the bill, VA would be required to submit a report to Congress containing the findings of the program review, the GE staffing assessment, and the goals to address the specialty care needs of veterans. Next slide. So that's a, a kind of a quick rundown, uh, section by section of what this bill would do. Um, and so now I would like to just take a couple of quick moments to explain to you how you can help us advocate for this legislation. We know through our conversations with the uh, House and Senate uh, Veterans Affairs Committees, the passage of this bill is a top, is the top, number one, health related priority for the House of Veterans Affairs uh, Committee. The health subcommittee reviewed the legislation in mid-March, and in fact, Mr. Butler, testified on behalf of PVA at that hearing. Right now, the bill is gaining traction in co-sponsors and we're told that the goal is to try and have it marked up by the full committee before the August recess. So essentially during the month of July. Um, if you haven't done so already, now is a good time to send a letter using PVA Action Force to your elected officials, urging them to pass this important legislation. If you have already sent a letter, we're asking that you call your elected officials uh, at their local office and urge them to support the bill. In fact, Congress is in recess through mid-July, so this is an excellent time to call that local office and urge them to pass the bill. And finally, uh, just a quick reminder, the goal of any grassroots effort is increasing mass participation on a particular issue. So you can amplify your voice on this issue by asking your friends, family, and coworkers, and others to send the letter or make a similar call on your behalf as well. Next slide. And finally, just some resources for you uh, regarding this issue and the legislation. Uh, we have the, two, the links here for the two bills. Uh, they are both identical, so you really only need to view one. Uh, we also have the link to PVA's policy paper, expanding access to VA's long-term services and supports. Uh, and I encourage you to read that as well so you get a better understanding of what our position is on this issue. And then finally, the link is included here for VA's HCVS resources. And now I invite Heather to, to rejoin us uh, for the Q&A session and we look forward to any questions that you may have. Well, thank you, uh, Morgan and Roscoe, for going over um, a little bit about some of the benefits that are available through the VA now uh, for uh, home-based care, and then also talking about uh, the legislation that would then increase access to those benefits. Um, I will have a, a question I thought it would be good to start with because we did talk quite a bit about the veteran-directed care program. I know that VA has already said that they are going to do some expanding of that program and a few other home and community-based services. Uh, Morgan, can you give us a little um, background on that and kind of where VA's 
efforts are already at to make these programs more available? Sure, sure. Uh, and thank you for that question. Uh, earlier this year, VA did announce that it would be increasing some HCBS programs targeting geriatric or extending care by the end of 26, excuse me, 2026, making them available uh, at every medical center, along with 75 additional home-based primary care teams. VA is going to be adding 58 medical foster homes and 70 veteran directed care programs to VA medical centers nationwide. The expansion effort, though, was supposed to start this fiscal year, um, but VA hasn't shared any information with us about the new locations yet. Um, and perhaps most important, the principal difference between VA's effort and this legislation is that the, the Elizabeth Dole bill would require the expansion to occur within a two-year period versus the five-year period that VA is proposing. Well, thank you, uh, Morgan, that's good to know. There was another section of the bill um, that I saw about veteran-directed care and caregivers being able, or veterans being able to continue to pay their caregivers um, even when they're hospitalized. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how that, what that provision would do and, and PVA's interest in that? Sure. Um, would you like me to handle that one or Roscoe? Either one of you. Okay. Um, so yes, in, back in section four of the bill, uh, where it talks about the expansion of the Veterans Directed Care Program, um, there is a provision in there that would allow um, participants of that program to retain the payments uh, so, they, so they can retain their attendant in the event that they're hospitalized. Um, obviously, the, the need to have the attendant, they wouldn't be there to provide clinical care, but we have heard stories, uh, we've covered a couple of them uh, in our testimony before about PVA members uh, who expressed uh, an interest and more importantly, a need to have that attendant with them uh, to perform tasks, uh, simple tasks such as um, uh, using the call button for the nurse uh, or to help assist them to cough. Um, so obviously this uh, change would be extremely beneficial to some of our members uh, should this legislation be passed. Thanks, Morgan. Um, one question that we've had several times is um, related specifically to the benefits currently available and uh, who can access them. So um, Roscoe, um, one of the questions has been, is there a difference between veterans who are service connected and veterans who are not service connected um, in terms of the home and community-based services that they can access? Can you uh, give us your thoughts on that? Uh, all of the home care programs, um, Veterans are eligible for the home care programs because they are a part of the medical benefit package. Uh, someone asked a question about, uh, I, I keep saying that uh, if they meet the clinical eligibility. Basically, that's where the clinical care provider has to make a medical assessment that you need to be in that program. So that's what that pretty much uh, uh, applies to. But if you're um, accessing the home care uh, program, uh, they're part of the medical benefit package. If you're accessing the purchase care program, then you have to meet the caregiver, I mean, the uh, 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 community care program's eligibility. Doesn't mean say mean that you have to be service connected, but to be referred out in the community, the caregiver has to determine that either, and that's between you and the caregiver making those determinations that you need to uh, VA either can't offer the services, they can't offer offer it timely, and therefore you need to be referred out in the community for that care. It's not, 
any longer tied to whether you're service connected or non-service connected. Thanks, uh, Roscoe, for, for going through that. Um, there's been, uh, there was a question related to um, what efforts are there to try to get VA more broadly to partner with um, other community-based options? Many veterans are also eligible for Medicare programs, Medicaid programs. Uh, we talked about uh, the PACE program being one of those that there's an effort in this legislation to put more of a connection uh, but are you aware of uh, any efforts to help VA better, uh, additional efforts to help VA better partner with or link with um, services that veterans may already be eligible for that are in the community? I think that the only program that I'm aware of is the PACE right now, but the bill does require VA and uh, other federal, state, and local uh, agencies to work together. So VA, if they haven't been reaching out to those uh, agencies, they the bill requires that they work with those agencies in, in establishing uh, uh, partnerships to ensure that veterans' home community-based needs are being met. Great, thank you for that, Roscoe. Um, we have a, another question um, about how veterans can find out more information about where the Veteran Directed Care Program is or about, uh, about some of these services that are available. Um, what would you recommend to, to veterans that are looking for that information? You know, we've been <laughs> trying to uh, get our hands on that information ourselves for a while. Uh, what I would um, direct uh, each person to have a discussion with uh, the um, head of the uh, geriatric and extended care services at your local VA to see if those uh, services are available at your local VA. Um, and I'll reach out to uh, geriatric and extended care services to see if they have a comprehensive listing of locations where those services are, and then follow up and share that information with everyone uh, 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 after the call. Now, what we've been told is that there is gonna be a press release on where they're gonna roll out the new uh, VDC centers at maybe we, that's an opportunity for us to go back to geriatric and extended care services and say, hey, uh, in addition to mentioning where you're gonna roll out those new facilities, could you also include where the, the locations of the existing sites is so it's more comprehensive? So I'll go out, go back and do that as well. So, and Heather, if I might add, um, so I mentioned in the one section where uh, this legislation would require VA to create the one-stop shop for all information pertaining to HCVS. Uh, you know, we've had several conversations with the, uh, the GEC office uh, and other parts of Veterans Experience Office uh, with VA is a good example. Uh, you know, where we've expressed a concern about the way that a lot of information is being relayed. Uh, and I certainly don't see that ch changing anytime soon. And because we do have a pretty good relationship with uh, the GEC office, and they would likely be uh, the owner of uh, establishing that new website, where we will be seeking opportunities to kind of weigh in with recommendations uh, on how the information is presented, what's presented. Um, and, uh, and hopefully uh, improve communication, kind of clear up some of the confusion that's out there. So uh, another question we've had, um, and I know this is coming up more and more, is um, does the bill cover the cost of 24-7 uh, care in the home? Um, and we've had some questions recently, I know about private duty nursing um, as well, and, and uh, it looks like there are some things that are currently available, but maybe uh, you could just briefly again um, 
Roscoe uh, talk with us about the cap that currently exists on home care, the 65% cap, and what this legislation would do to, to remedy that. Okay, but, but Heather, uh, if, if it's okay with you, I wanted, I can also talk a little bit about the information that we just recently was told about uh, private duty care, 24 by seven. And we're in the process of reviewing VA's field guidebook that was provided to us to get a better understanding. So VA, we've received questions about whether uh, VA could provide 24 by seven private duty nursing care because we were under the impression that they couldn't, VA could not. And we reached out to VA's geriatric office, central office of extended care services, and was informed that they issued some guide field guidance uh, a couple of years ago. And it outlined under certain situations when VA could authorize 24 by seven private duty nursing care. And we've been told that they have had training and education to all VA geriatrics and extended care offices on this new criteria. So every VA facility should be aware of when they can provide 24 by seven private duty nursing care and under what circumstances. As, a, as I mentioned, we're currently right now, we just received the guidebook late last night. I sent it out to uh, key uh, leadership and we're in the process, our medical service team and so forth is in the process of reviewing that information. Uh, as it relates to the 65% cap, as I mentioned, the significance of that is that if a veteran is receiving uh, veteran directed care, uh, and we got to get clarification if it extends to other home community based services, it will allow VA to uh, pay up to 100% of what it would cost if the veteran was receiving nursing home care. And, I, and in certain situations and circumstances, it would allow VA to exceed 100% of the cost based upon medical need. So if the, if the VA determines that there's a sufficient medical need to pay above that amount, it will uh, allow VA to do so. And we ask for clarification on what uh, types of situations would warrant paying the young above the uh, 100%. And the one example that they gave us was someone who is on a ventilator and is vent dependent. That does, mean, that does not mean that that one example is the only example or only case, but uh, you know, it is based upon your AVA physician making a medical need determination. So there could be multiple examples or cases out there that a VA physician may determine that uh, based upon your medical condition warrants extending uh, the payment above the 100% cap if you've reached that limitation. Thank you, Roscoe. And, and that's, as Roscoe said, something that we're gonna continue to look into what's currently available, but also we know that VA has been interested in removing the cap um, on home-based care that currently exists um, so that they will be able to um, pay uh, for veterans to get more care in their homes 
uh, up to and potentially even over the 100% of what it would cost uh, if that veteran was in a care facility. Um, I wanted to uh, just briefly see if uh, Doug Woodard, who's with our Veterans Benefits Department, he's been behind the scenes um, answering a lot of the individual questions that we've been getting uh, from you on, on benefits. And Doug, I'm just wonder if you could uh, maybe talk a little bit for everybody, uh, what should someone do if they um, are not sure what programs are available to them or they're having problems accessing them? What is the best thing that we can recommend for them to do? Well, that, that's a really good question, Heather. And I've uh, typed that into a couple of individuals in the chat and maybe in the Q&A. But I really do recommend that you reach out to your local PVA National Service Officer and get in touch with him or her and explain to them what you're looking to do, what uh, has transpired up to this point, whether you've received a decision in some type of request for um, any type of health care benefit. And just to make you aware that uh, people talk a lot about appeals with uh, perhaps compensation benefits, but veterans do have the ability and the right to appeal healthcare decisions. Now, obviously uh, an appeal is gonna be a last resort uh, because a lot of times, if not the majority of the times, um, issues can be worked out, especially on the healthcare side without having to appeal. But again, uh, if you have an issue arise with a benefit to include healthcare benefits, anything that uh, Roscoe and Morgan have described thus far, please contact your uh, local PVA service officer and he or she can direct you uh, about the benefit, perhaps the eligibility requirement, what to do if you've been denied. Um, if your local uh, PVA service officer does not know the answer, uh, then uh, they're, they're trained to run it up the chain of command until they uh, are able to find the answer. Uh, if you don't know um, the contact number, uh, you can uh, send me a, a message in the chat where your location is, and I will uh, get in touch with or put you in touch with who your local service officer is. Thank you. Any anything else, Heather? No, thank you, Doug, for that for that reminder. And uh, again, just want to encourage everybody if you have. If you heard about a program today, you're wondering if you might qualify, um, or if you've had problems accessing that program, definitely reach out to your service officer um, and see if they can assist you um, in understanding what programs might be available um, to you and your family. Um, we are at the top of the hour. So um, I do wanna say if you didn't get your question answered today, um, we do have the email addresses on the screen. Um, uh, Morgan and Roscoe, um, who can be in touch with you um, and connect you as needed to the right, um, the right person within PBA. Um, we also wanted to remind everyone, we did record today's webinar and it will be made available uh, on the PBA website and to all who registered and attended today's event. We will also provide uh, the PowerPoint slides so you'll have access uh, to those as well and uh, continue to stay tuned as we uh, work on this legislation to try to get it over the finish line uh, to improve the benefits available. And then like we said, work with your PBA service officer uh, to make sure you're able to access the benefits um, that you might currently uh, be eligible uh, to receive. Um, with that, I just wanna thank everyone for your uh, time today. Um, and we appreciate your, your dialing in to us um, and we look forward uh, to connecting with you um, in the future. Thank you and have a good day.